everybody. Hello, welcome. I'm in Flagstaff. It's 75 degrees. I'm sitting on a patio right now and really just, I have to wear a sweater because it's so chilly outside. Um, <laughs> so sorry not to rub it in. I really haven't been able to get out of the heat as much as I would like to. So a little rubbing in, I feel like is okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start my script here. So uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us at Secular AZ. Again, if you are, uh, you know, visiting us, whether it's on the webinar or on Facebook, please feel free to make sure you uh, hit everyone so that you're you're talking to everybody, but let us know who you are, where you're from, why you're here, all that kind of stuff. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state, and we've been doing it for over a decade. Um, we have some great programming, our Friday updates. You know, we get all kinds of amazing speakers. Uh, you, many of you, I can recognize your names. I know you've been here before. So historians, authors, elected officials, journalists, you name it. Um, next Friday, we're going to be kicking off our um, exploration into uh, evangelical extremist obsession with guns. Um, and we are going to be having a conversation with Dr. Joseph Slaughter, Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Guns and Society, to explore how God and guns go together in the U.S. in U.S. history. And I really enjoy doing these thematic uh, discussions. So if you have something that you're interested in, please let us know. I would love to do a deep dive on a topic that's something that's important to all of you. Also, um, our, our topic this year for our Secular Summit, which is going to be January 6th of next year, is going to be about rural issues face, you know, the things that rural communities face in light of some of these, you know, um, evangelical extremist laws that are being pushed, you know, uh, whether it's vouchers in communities that don't even have private schools or it's hospitals and the lack of hospitals. And now the fact that we're having this kind of brain drain um, with doctors leaving the state uh, or states that implement these horrible policies. So if you've got an idea, let us know. Or if you have an idea for one of our rural speakers, please let us know. Um, you also, right now, we are in the middle of a membership drive. Uh, for 2023. And our rates are going to be going up in 2024. So if you become or renew your membership now, we've got some cool gifts, including this little secular AZ coffee mug. So uh, we've got tote bags, we've got bumper stickers, um, but you can check all that out on our website. Uh, today, I'm really excited uh, because we are going to be talking to Sarah Mosliner. She is a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy, Anthropology, and Religion at Central Michigan University, where she teaches courses on the history of religious and racial discrimination in the United States. She's been studying evangelical purity culture for over 15 years and has numerous publications, including the book Virgin Nation, Sexual Purity and American Adolescence, which demonstrates how sexual purity campaigns and rhetoric have been used by white Protestants since the 19th century to obtain greater political power and cultural influence. I'll tell you what, Sarah, I have been waiting for this discussion for a long time. Um, you know, my parents didn't really raise me in the, you know, in an evangelical setting. And I really didn't even know what purity culture was until I moved to Arizona. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was an undergrad, when I went to ASU the first time, when it didn't take exactly, um, I did a whole, it was a women in religion course. And because I was fairly new to the state, I decided to study Mormonism and do some reading specifically about the roles of women there. And that's when I first really learned about it. And then with all of our evangelical, for, you know, ex-evangelical speakers that come and talk to us, some of the stories, I'll tell you what, blow me away. So tell me, if I missed anything in your um, in your bio, let me know. And then I'm just going to pass it off to you because I can't wait. Great. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here with you all. I'm, I'm so encouraged by the work that you're doing. Um, it's, uh, I, you know, I am in Michigan, by the way, um, uh, here in the middle of Michigan, um, Mount Pleasant, uh, which is the, um, ancestral land of the Anishinaabe people and the current home of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe. And, um, and we are fortunate uh, right now because um, 
in Michigan because of our elected officials. Uh, I feel like I can trust them. So, um, but I know this is not the case for people in many states. And I have uh, many colleagues who are leaving their jobs um, because of uh, there's so much, uh, cause you know, there's so much populist fear around higher education right now, which I, I can feel <laughs> in the classroom. So so it's so wonderful to meet with a group of people who uh, who I don't need to be anxious around in terms of, you know, uh, saying something that might spark um, controversy. Because um, we got some pretty uh, intensive things to talk about. So let me go ahead and share. Um, I do have, of course, a PowerPoint because I am a teacher. Um, do, 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 do. I can remember how to share. Um, let's see here. Heard me a moment. The green, the green button where it says share screen does, I don't know if your Zoom looks the same as mine, but then yeah. from there, if you click it, it'll ask you which one of your. Got it. Yeah, I think the thing I did not do was actually open. Yeah, you have to make sure your presentation is uh, yeah, presentation yeah. is actually open, which it's thundering here right now, just so y'all know. Different. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad to hear because yeah, I've just been following so much of uh, what's been happening in the southwest and the west in terms of heat. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. All right, go ahead um, and take it away, Sarah. Thank you. All right. Can you, let's see, I, yeah, I'm gonna, be, I did this for like a year straight. There we go. Is everyone seeing that okay? Yes. Great, thank you for that. So I, I gave my talk a title today because I just, I feel like, I'm not doing my job if I don't. <laughs> and to also let you know kind of what our content is. So it's going to be some difficult content. I study, um, my study of evangelical purity culture has taken me in a couple different directions. One direction has been the study of uh, sexual abuse within the Southern Baptist Convention, which I'll be talking about today. So just to be prepared for that. Um, and then also uh, talking about uh, racial violence. Uh, uh, rhetorical and um, and physical violence. And so both of these um, have become, uh, have continued to sort of rear up in within the SBC. And, um, and I think are important for thinking about um, what the organization, the institution has been trying to do in terms of um, influencing the way the rest of us think about sexuality and think about race. Um, Sarah, real quick, um, yeah. uh, somebody pointed out to me that your presentation is in presenter view. Oh. And I mean, I don't, it just means that it's smaller and it means that you can see what's coming up next and see your notes. But if, you, if there's yeah. a way for you to put it in full screen, that would be, uh, I guess, preferable. Thank if not, it's not that big of a deal, but somebody pointed it out. Yeah, I don't know how to. Hmm. It looks like you're working on a Mac and I don't speak Mac, so I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> yeah, let me stop the share then. Uh, yeah, we're at 48 uh, attendees today. I think this might be record breaking, Sarah. You really oh. brought people. No pressure then. <laughs> yeah, no pressure at all. No, you're fine. As I struggle <laughs> to, uh, yeah. All right. People hand me Apple devices and I just get really confused. Right. Okay, that, that looks like full screen now. Or Good, yeah. Well, let there's... me just go to uh, slideshow here. There we go. Okay, all there right. you go. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> yes. So a little bit about me. 
Um, this is, I had great hair in the 1980s. It was perfect. So I always want to include that. Um, so yes, I am a lecturer now. I have a, a PhD in U.S. religious history. I teach courses on uh, the history of uh, racism and religious discrimination in the United States. So that is uh, my uh, my job at Central Michigan University. Um, I am a former evangelical, what some people call ex-evangelicals, which has been a very fascinating development to see and then to realize that you are it. <laughs> um, and I understand you've had many ex-evangelical presenters who have come. And so I have, as part of my research, have been following that development because sort of the, the Venn diagram of people who identify as ex-evangelical and people who've grown up and out of purity culture within white evangelicalism is pretty much a perfect circle. Um, but yeah, so this is my story. I was raised in Western Pennsylvania. My father was a pastor. Um, I went to a Christian school, K through 12, um, went to Christian college, and, and so this is very much uh, the world I grew up in, um, and so one that I went on to study um, as a graduate student. And so uh, my most recent uh, research project, oh, sorry, back up here to the most important thing. Um, so after I finished my first book, Virgin Nation, um, and it was published, I had this memory come back to me, which had been deeply buried. And that was that I had written a letter to the editor of my local paper about teaching uh, sexual abstinence in uh, in public schools. Now, of course, I didn't go to the public school, but I had lots of opinions about what should happen there. And I, and so if you read this over here on the left, it's teeny tiny. I was able to find it. Um, and what is really striking to me is one, I barely have a memory of this. And two, it totally supports my argument that young people were being sort of called up to represent something in a very public way um, about themselves and also about um, as a way to sort of lead the nation in a particular direction. And I had no recollection that this was something that I had done myself. Um, and, and I am a little older than people who really got caught up in, in say, um, the I Kiss Dating Goodbye and True Love Waits, which I'll be talking about today. Um, so it's just really uh, baffling to me to know like, wow, this is much more part of, this is much more of my story than I ever um, thought that it was. Um, so my current project is called the After Purity Project in which I interview people who've grown up and out of evangelical purity culture. And one of the things, and so two of the things that I have focused on um, are the gender-based violence, right? Which comes in many forms from simply gender discrimination, that is uh, young women and girls not seeing leaders who are women in their churches, all the way to uh, clergy sexual abuse. So the amount, the range of harm that I have been uh, studying because I study purity culture um, is, is a spectrum and certainly a much broader spectrum than I ever anticipated. The other thing with the After Purity Project is that the vast majority of the people I've interviewed um, are white women like myself. And so as someone who has studied and, um, and used this thing called critical race theory, you might have heard it recently, I have been able to bring that in, in particular a subfield of that called critical whiteness studies. So I've been asking a lot of questions about white racial identity in relationship to sexual purity. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit of that today. And again, if, um, I think there are, if you have questions along the way, you can raise your hand. I will try and do my best um, to notice those. Um, and I will try and stop it at the end of every slide to see if there's a need for clarification or anything like that. But I do, because I am a teacher at the very end, I have discussion questions. Um, and so we can use those or 
we can uh, work with your questions as well. Okay, so speaking of questions, these are the questions that I started out with in this current research project. Um, we've had this concept come along, and if you've come to these uh, discussions regularly, you've probably heard this concept, white Christian nationalism. And um, when I was working on virgination, right, we um, certainly the ideas of it were there, but we didn't have the framework that we do now. And, um, and so now it's been uh, much easier for me to be able to ask the question, right? How does sexual purity ideology, right? How do these teachings reinforce the beliefs of white Christian nationalism? And this is really the argument that I make in the book, Virgin Nation, that it really offered white Protestants um, a, a degree of moral authority on the national stage, one that we continue to contend with. And this has very long history going all the way back to the 19th century, if not further. The other question um, I asked, because I, I have been studying um, uh, sexual purity and clergy sex abuses, is how does this culture contribute to the problem of clergy sex abuse? So we'll be talking about that a little bit too. So these are the questions I've been exploring for about five years now, and I just wanted to give you um, a few of the things that I um, have learned along the way. And things that, and of course, knowing what your organization is about, I've, I've tried to sort of pick things that I know are of special concern to people um, who are very interested in uh, issues of separation of church and state. And I think if you look at this image here, um, you can see right away why the concept of white Christian nationalism is so important. Um, so what you see before you is an image of two dozen adolescents from the Southern Baptist Convention. This is 1994, so the Clinton administration. Two years before the Southern Baptist Convention started, True Love Waits. And it was started because the Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop, um, went to churches and encouraged them, and this was earlier in the decade before, and encouraged them to start their own sex education programs that would focus on abstinence-only education. If you remember the 80s and the 90s, there was um, a, a very palpable sex panic um, around HIV AIDS, right? Of course, sex panic, yet also lots of ignorance. So a very um, interesting time um, uh, to study in terms of thinking about uh, the history of sexuality. But the other thing that emerged was a crisis around teen pregnancy. And what was changing in particular were the rates of teen pregnancy among white teenagers. And that this sort of, um, you know, pointed to a decline in uh, the United States, right? If white people are in trouble, then uh, the whole nation is going uh, is going down the tubes. So True Love Waits started from this idea that um, that teenagers, and especially Christian teenagers, needed to be a model of and uh, and. As I was not part of True Love Waits at all, and yet I was very much informed by this teaching. It was just kind of in the air. And, um, but True Love Waits, like they didn't, you know, they didn't want it to just be in the air. They wanted to have a real impact. So what they started doing was asking young people to make pledges, make purity pledges. And, um, and there would be events with parents involved. In some cases, they would stage mock, you know, people would stage mock weddings and, um, and the, the adolescents instead of, you know, um, taking vows, they would, you know, pledge purity. So lots of interesting and curious ways that, um, that youth were being drawn into this through, through their churches. Um, and so what True Love Waits did was they asked people to sign a pledge card to keep for themselves and then send one into the organization. And so what you see here on the lawn of the National Mall are signed pledge cards that have been attached to tiny little stakes 
And I want to pause here a moment because I just saw the mailman out the window. And if I know my companion, well, he is going to start barking very loudly. <laughs> This is his job, so we have to stop and recognize that he is doing his work. <laughs> oh, he's he's being a good boy for sure. Yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll always we'll always pause for dogs. And yes, for yes. Dogs. yeah. The dogs can go ahead and run it for now. Right, right. Okay, all right. We are back. So this event that's happening here in Washington D.C. was. Um, was sponsored by a youth organization, Youth for Christ, in um, and also True Love Waits. And they did a, um, a whole event uh, called True Love Waits, a national celebration. And there's actually a whole video of it. It's very patriotic. You know, you have the swirling flag and everything. So this was, it was very, it's a, it was a very intentional unfolding and uh, of, um, of this entire movement um, as a way to really, um, place these teenagers who made these commitments as a kind of hope, you know, as a kind of moral compass for the nation. And, um, and so several of them went um, and uh, with the leader of True Love Waits, Richard Ross, who was a youth minister at the time, uh, and they met with President Clinton. Um, and uh, and so they had, and they met with other legislators. So they were there to make an impact um, and to really send a message about the moral state of the nation. And if you remember 1994 and the Clinton administration, um, you know, the SBC was one of the groups that really despised Clinton and really exploited his, um, his sexual choices as a way to establish um, their own moral authority. And, um, and of course he made that, <laughs> to be fair, Clinton made that very easy for them. Um, but of course, very curious given how white evangelicals have voted in our last two elections. Um, now what's interesting is that, um, Clinton, um, right. Clinton didn't say anything to them that day that, that made them feel encouraged, but, Two years later, um, President Clinton would sign his hallmark legislation of, on um, uh, welfare reform, right? This has been coming for a long time. It was one of the, the most important accomplishments of his administration. And attached to that law was funding for abstinence only education. And this is uh, the excerpt of that. So at the very end of it. So that raises a lot of questions I have written elsewhere um, and about um, how this um, brings up the, uh, um, all the assumptions about who gets welfare um, and, 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 uh, and how that, um, how we need to ask questions about this thing we now uh, know as the welfare queen, which was uh, a, a character, a figure that Reagan introduced and how the, the myth of a woman of color who is not sexually responsible and has children and, and therefore takes advantage of uh, uh, the federal we welfare system, right? All of that was this was, part of the response here, um, but also addressing what they perceive to be the problem of teen pregnancy. Now, um, and so I wanna show you, right? These were the, I think, some of the most important things that came out of that, and I'll explain why in just a minute. So according to this uh, law, abstinence only education, right? If people were receiving funding um, and it was about I think $50 million initially. And, of course, and so when, and you may recall when Bush was elected in 2000, he is going to grow that number significantly. Um, but this legislation, what it says is if you're gonna be teaching abstinence only education, you must teach that the expected standard of sexual activity is within the context of marriage, right? 
regardless of the fact that this is not at all true. I think it's, you know, well over 90% of people um, have sex uh, before marriage, right? So this is not at all in <laughs> um, aligning with, with what's really happening. Um, it also made the argument without data that premarital sex causes psychological and physical problems. It also said that out of wedlock births are likely to have negative consequences for the child. Now, all of these were the results of these abstinence only congressional hearings that were held, um, that were sponsored by Senator Arlen Specter. I think there were uh, two or three, um, and they brought in different groups uh, to contribute to the conversation. One of those groups was True Love Waits from the Southern Baptist Convention. And if you look at, as I did, um, their testimony uh, in these hearings, this is exactly what you hear from them. So we know that the Southern Baptist Convention through True Love Waits has directly impacted um, sex education in the United States. That, um, and so as I, as I tell my students, if you learned in your sex education class in your public school that premarital sex causes harm, um, you have uh, learned a religious lesson, not an accurate lesson about sex education, okay? Um, and of course, there's lots of work on uh, sex education battles, but, but I wanted to show you like where, where this really happened, where we see evidence that the Southern Baptist Convention had directly influenced um, not only welfare policy, but sex education. Um, okay, so any questions about this piece from anyone? So not, we, not really any questions, but there is a comment from um, Marshall. Uh, yeah. He says, Youth for Christ, Jack Worston and Billy Graham were involved. Absolutely, so Billy Graham, in fact, Youth for Christ is how uh, is how Billy Graham got his start. Um, and in Virgin Nation, I have a whole chapter on Billy Graham because he was, you know, a lot of his um, a lot of his preaching, especially at the beginning of the Cold War, was about sexual immorality and how sexual immorality made the United States um, weak in the face of communism, right? And so this is part of sort of this evangelical tradition of connecting the fate of the nation state to sexual immorality, right? And evangelicals can come in and say, well, we have the solution to that, right? So yes, a Billy Graham is such a fascinating figure in this. And, um, and yeah, so he's, a, he's sort of the precursor in many ways. But there's, yeah. a, there's one other quick comment, and it's very accurate. One thing to remember about the Reagan era was he did nothing but ignore AIDS until it spread to the heterosexual community. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. true. Um, yeah. Karen says, sex ed in public school doesn't really happen in AZ. However, I happen to have been on the school board for a district that adopted back in 2014, I think, mm -hmm. Uh, comprehensive sex ed and a partnership with you know experts and the the longitudinal um, you know reports that we have from now almost ten years of that yeah. program. Guess what? Unwanted pregnancies are down. Um, uh, STI is STI understanding is up. Um, the number of kids who understand what a healthy relationship is, who know the vocabulary and words like boundaries and consent, mm -hmm. all of those have increased. And so, right. you know, that's why I will always say every accusation is a confession, because if you don't want kids to have the tools to keep themselves sa safe, but you're also at the same time calling like teachers or principals, like, you know, groomers and indoctrinators there's there's more to that story you know absolutely. and we see it all that you know sarah you probably know this better than anybody yeah who, absolutely. who are the perpetrators of csa yeah oh, yeah go ahead exactly exactly and this this is where we're going yeah so thank you for those great comments and i do want to recommend um a book by my colleague uh dr anthony petro he wrote a book called after the wrath 
of God about um, religious responses to HIV AIDS. And that's where I got the piece of information about C. Everett Koop from. Um, so a really, uh, really important and well done book. Um, all right, so just to give you some more insight into the influence of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and I wanna to talk to you about the purity pop stars as, as we have started calling them. I, I knew my career had reached a new level when I was interviewed about Britney Spears. Um, I've also appeared in articles with the Jonas Brothers. Um, so yeah, not things I ever intended. Um, so in the 1990s, you may recall that that was the decade that Ellen DeGeneres came out on national television on her sitcom. And this was a first in the United States. Um, and it was on ABC, wow, which is owned by Disney and the Southern Baptist Convention um, was very angry and they threatened a boycott and, uh, and claimed that you know, ABC and Disney were not, not promoting family values. Um, now, uh, and so they threatened a boycott, which never happened, but Disney did begin experiencing financial loss up until the 2000s. Um, and meanwhile, the SBC is gaining significant influence. Um, now, what is interesting, what's really interesting is what happens next, right? So along with the SBC or the, with Disney creating uh, Disney family, um, they, you also started seeing all of these pop stars wearing purity rings and talking about um, having commitments to sexual purity. And all of them, all of these pictured here, at one point had contracts with Disney. So it's a it's a fascinating thing to to think about that uh, that level of influence and of course Disney is in a very different place right now it's been fascinating to watch how they've been contending with uh, Governor Ron DeSantis um, but this is what was happening um, in the 90s and uh, the first decade of the 2000s. Um, so this is the impact that the SBC is having. Okay. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the origins of the Southern Baptist Convention, um, which has a deeply racist history, um, as many churches do, many white churches do in the United States. But the SBC started um, because of a de debate over slavery. Uh, Baptists in the North uh, didn't agree with Baptists in the South who believed that you could own slaves and still be a member of the church. And, um, and so when that conflict came to a head, um, the Baptists in the Confederacy created their own church and this is the Southern Baptist Convention. Along with that, you had uh, beliefs of, in something called the curse of Ham, which comes from the book of Genesis. Um, and it is the story of after the flood, um, the story of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it's a, some very convoluted and, and just really wrong biblical interpretation. But people in the South use this story as a way to justify slavery by claiming that people of African descent were created by God to be, um, uh, to be enslaved. And this story, the curse of Ham proved that because Ham was cursed by Noah to be a servant of servant to his brothers. And somehow <laughs> um, the, those three brothers became the fathers of three different races, right? This is the mythology here, right? And so this is part of um, the SBC uh, theological framework and um, which created the division between uh, the two, uh, the Northern and Southern churches. And so the SBC has since you know apologized for this and you see pockets where people are doing good work um, around issues of race um, but most recently with kind of the panic over critical race theory that has been 
brought by kind of alarmist right-wing activists, right? There's been no effort to actually understand what critical race theory is um, beyond simply being about, you know, studying the history of race and racism. And so the SBC um, has really pushed back against it and said that it is anti-gospel, that it, right, it has no place in the church. And, and as a result, many uh, people of color, including pastors, have left the SBC since this started. And it's interesting because for a while, the debate over SBC and the controversy over, um, um, over clergy sex abuse were, uh, were both active within uh, the church and sort of making headlines and um, and getting and drawing all sorts of commentary. Um, and it was interesting to see that um, any conversation about race has completely disappeared. And um, and some people have said, you know, this is it is like it, that on some level the institution, you know, had to make a decision about who who they couldn't afford to lose, right? Because the people driving the um, issues around sexual assault are white women, and of course around critical race theory, people of color. Um, whether, and whether that was an intentional or not, um, there's no way to know, but that was certainly felt by people, right? That they had to make a choice um, and, um, and, uh, and and of course, people are leaving for both reasons now, and their numbers are, are really uh, quickly diminishing, um, which is interesting because the SBC has long been the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Okay. Any question about this history or, or comments? So far, there is nothing in the chat, mostly just jokes coming from all of us. So. <laughs> I'll spare you. <laughs> I'm sorry to be missing those, but yes, it is hard to like go through. I've learned it's hard to go through a presentation and keep up with the chat, but the chat is always so much more fun, right? I love, I love. <laughs> if the, anything, so, so please, if you can save it and send it to me, if that's okay with everyone, I would love to enjoy that. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, so as far as sexual purity goes, it has its own deeply racist history. And as someone who is also a 19th century historian, it has been important for me to retrieve that history for people who have grown up and out of contemporary evangelical purity culture. Because um, this the concept of sexual purity has been around for a long time. Um, and, um, and I have here, um, an image from Ida B. Wells' um, publication, Southern Whores, Lynch Law in its phases, um, because sexual purity became a weapon, um, a weapon against Black people uh, during Jim Crow segregation, right? The ideology of sexual purity was a way uh, to maintain the strict separation between black people and white people and the fear, especially that white women were going to take a fancy to black men and maybe want to marry them and have children with them. And of course that was not legal in most places, um, but more than that, um, sexual purity was a way uh, to control uh, white women to promote ideals of white womanhood and to claim that white women needed protection from the black male rapist. And, Will, and, and what Wells did is that she recognized that this was a myth. She called it the lynching myth, that black men are sexually dangerous, white women are sexually pure, um, but this was so strongly held, especially in the South, that even when there was just a rumor that a black man had spoken inappropriately to a white woman, the, viol the, the violence, the anti-black violence that ensued was just overwhelming, right? And here we can talk about um, 
uh, we can talk about Emmett Till, right? This is the story of Emmett Till um, and the white woman who, you know, pretty much lied on the stand about what he did and, um, and her husband and brother and his brother uh, murdered. Emmett Till. We can talk about this in the context of uh, the Tulsa race riots, where it was just a rumor. A black man got into an elevator with a white woman, and, and there was a rumor that he did something inappropriate. And as a result, entire city blocks of a place that was called Black Wall Street, because it was so economically um, successful, was just destroyed, right? So so sexual purity has, has carried a great deal of racial power with it that's embodied in these, uh, in beliefs about white womanhood, okay? Um, now, the thing is, by the time we get to the, night, to, uh, the 1990s, none of this history is known because white evangelicals had um, by this time, become convinced that the best approach to thinking about race was uh, through colorblindness, right? This idea that, oh, you know, in Christ, there is no, right, there is no black or white. We are all the same. And so, um, and so there was no effort to think about sexual purity as something that might have a history and that might have a deeply problematic history. Um, they simply wanted to, um, and so they believed they were doing something fresh and new. Um, as it happens, there were actually people making taking purity pledges in the 19th century. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so they didn't have a historical understanding. And in doing that, I think, you know, kind of replicated some things and created um, a culture where um, that, that perpetrated a lot of not just gender-based and sexual harm, but a lot of racial harm. Um, if you look at these, so these are two versions of the pledge. Uh, the one in the middle, um, I think is the, was the more traditional one, but let me just read it for you. Um, it says, believing that true love waits, I make a commitment to God, myself, my fam family, uh, those I love, sorry, my, uh, those I date, my future mate and my future children to be sexually pure from today until the day I enter a covenant marriage relationship. Um, and so that's a lot. You know, these are teenagers who are taking these pledges. Um, and, uh, and as I said, like they're not just being asked to make a personal commitment, but they're taking a public stand. And I saw there was a hand that just came up. So um, I don't know how, if, if you have people unmute themselves or if you just want to pop something in the chat, I'm happy to. I am, I'm not seeing a hand up. I might be missing oh, okay. it, but usually folks will put it into the chat. You know, unfortunately, uh, Sarah, we get, we get some trolls here, if you can imagine that, so. No, okay, got it. All right, good. Um, so yeah, so just to reiterate, you know, True Love Waits was really attempting um, to situate adolescence um, as sort of this moral hope for the nation and um and by um creating a singular narrative around human sexuality a singular narrative around what it means to become an adult and along with that a significant amount of fear in some cases um, significant fear. I've interviewed people who have struggled with post-traumatic stress disorder um, in uh, around even just trying to have conversations around sexuality because they were so, um, because they had been taught that sex was so incredibly dangerous. Um, and, uh, right, and so again, right, there's this spectrum of harm um, and that, you know, and I wish it were just it, that that were the worst, but it is of course not. Um, what we know now 
is that at the same time, True Love Waits was getting young people to sign pledges um, to sexual purity is that there were sexual predators in the church. Um, and the church knew about it. They had kept a list for quite some time um, as, a, you know, as a protection against themselves. Um, but when survivors came forward and asked them to, uh, to make that list public, they claimed that they didn't have a list. Um, and so it's been many years of survivors having to advocate for themselves, right? And so look at these numbers. So the Houston Chronicle, this came out in 2017, right? This was as, as big as the spotlight, right? The Boston Globe breaking the story about um, clergy sex abuse in uh, the Boston Archdiocese, right? So this is that level of significance. Um, but they found 380 SBC leaders and volunteers that had faced sexual misconduct allegations, right? On, so on the record, these were things that were on the record. And think about how much of this stuff does not go on. Right. And so um, they were looking at the last 20 years and they identified 700 people as survivors of abuse. And so, um, so I just put in some headlines here. The series is quite remarkable. Um, it is not, as you can see, it is several. This is just a select, uh, selected. Um, headlines. They also have a database of every one of the abusers. So they now provided the list that the church refused to provide. Um, and the most difficult part is that, you know, there have been survivors for decades who have been speaking up about their experiences. And what these survivors have experienced is just, just really unspeakable. Um, and I, so I will attempt to speak about it. Um, Krista Brown, who, if you follow the SBC um, clergy sex abuse crisis, she has been probably the key person. She is someone who went on uh, to become a lawyer. Um, she experienced sexual abuse when she was 17 years old. Um, and for decades, she told the, uh, the church that they needed to do something about this problem. And their response initially was to laugh at her. Um, she kept going and their next response was to call her divisive. Um, you know, now it's quite common that survivors get called things like demon possessed. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean, any, yeah. any, any yeah. mental, you know, any. Mentally unstable. There was, there, you know, I follow him at Meta and he was talking mm -hmm. about some hate preacher who uh, said that autistic folks who are autistic are, you know, possessed by demons. And, you know, it was pretty horrible. I do have a question here in the chat asking for clarification. Uh, Wit, who's actually on our board of directors, asks, is that wording in the last bullet in the left hand list correct? Disclose bill because it says bill allowing churches to disclose abuse allegations passes both Texas chambers. Yes. Yes. I so don't wait, they, know. they will they actually now um will allow that that churches can disclose if there's abuse abuse happening within. Yes, that's my understanding. I'd have to right. So that's not something um I'd have to look more closely at where that where that bill is, um, and also whether or not the church is actually complying with it, right? Um, and so we do know, like they and in the mem, I should say the membership of the SBC two years ago, two and a half years ago, voted overwhelmingly to bring in um, an outside group to investigate, and um, and they did that work, and they produced a report which came out a year ago. Um, and so um, and so you can, and the Houston Chronicle has done a great job of reporting on that as well. Um, as far as the legal stuff happening in the state of Texas, I'm, I'm less familiar with it um, and, um, and exactly what, um, but also right, this is Texas. Um, I know that uh, Krista Brown has been doing work specifically in Texas, but the SBC is, is in other states too so well and I um, think I wonder if that's yeah. why Wit was bringing it up because 
you know, yeah. here, and here in Arizona, we had a state representative, uh, Stacy yeah. Travers, who uh, put forward a bill that would have uh, mandated that, um, you know, that clergy have to disclose sexual abuse because currently there's an exemption in the state of Arizona, as is many mm. other states. Yeah. So, you know, and so, and it didn't even get a hearing. It didn't even get a hearing, Sarah, because of yeah. course it didn't, it's Arizona. But like, so I think maybe Wit might be surprised that yeah. it passed really. both chambers. And maybe that's because of the SBC presence in Texas where like their members are so, there's so many of them that maybe they demanded yeah. it. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Those. that's great. Yeah, absolutely look into that and see because um, yeah. I mean, to get legislation changed, um, I mean, an, another big piece of legislation that people are working on in different places is statute of limitations, right? We know that's happened in New York. Um, there are survivors who have been advocating for that change in the state of Pennsylvania, right? Because we know, right, survivors often do not, um, uh, because of what sexual trauma does, um, you know, and on top of that religious trauma, oftentimes things don't click into place for a couple decades, right? And, um, and at that point, uh, the statute of limitations is up in a lot of states. So this has been a big, um, uh, this has been another place where activists have been pushing as well as to address, um, as to address statute of limitations. Um, yeah, any other questions about the the sort of uh, the Chronicle series and sort of the unfolding of this? Because it's, you know, it, it, it is very much still unfolding um, and it is really kind of very much roiling uh, the church um, and, um, but it has also emboldened many survivors to come forward. And, and this is just one church right? This is just one denomination, right? These things and many of these, I mean, there's no, um, sexual abuse can happen anywhere, right? And what I think is, distinguishes religious communities is how they respond to it. Yeah. And so, um, and I do, so the, the advocates, I, I work with the survivor advocates also, you know, because one of the questions is, that often comes up is, well, what is it? Is it because they are conservative? Um, and, and yes, I think there's especially theologically, theological reasons about that, certainly about gender, teachings about gender and sexuality, um, but it also happens in progressive religious groups as well. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm part of a larger uh, group of scholars studying religion and sexual abuse. And we're, you know, we have people studying Buddhism, people studying uh, Hinduism, studying um, immigrant churches in the United States, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Southern Baptist Church. So, um, so my, yes. my yeah. question, I have a question because I feel yeah. like and I wonder if it is just where we are, you know, with the, like the age of information, mm -hmm. you know, the world mm -hmm. is at our fingertips. You can find networks of ex-evangelicals, but like, you know, these um, people who are, who are coming up, but like, you know, ex-evangelical is actually a hashtag on Twitter and TikTok, right? And these people will post their experiences. So it, or like, you know, the shiny happy people documentary or the, the, the El Mundo church, the whatever, El, the lose of Del Mundo, whatever, like, but you know, what's happened in the Jehovah's Witness church and some mm -hmm. of these other different places, it seems more and more frequent. And maybe it's just because also the information age designs things to be in kind of a, you know, for you to be in an echo chamber. So I know that because of my preferences, but I do feel like, I guess my question is, I feel like there is, there are more people who are calling this out as it happens. Yes. And, and it seems that these, you know, and not to be ageist, but like these dinosaurs, and I mean just dinosaurs because they're so stuck in the past. They want things to be the way that they always were. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they're just resisting. And what it's causing is a reduction in those folks that are following them. And ultimately, I think a rejection of their faith 
altogether. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly. And I have, although, um, yeah, it's, I don't know that we have data on sort of the impact of people, um, you know, experiencing sexual abuse in their churches. Um, I know some who have horrific stories, but their faith is still intact. Um, and, and I know others who say, yep, yeah, not Christianity is completely corrupted, right? So, um, so yeah, it's interesting to see, but yes, I mean, social media has been a very powerful tool for survivors to be able to um, uh, get an audience, you know, to get an audience and to get public support, to, to find each other, to connect with each other. And I just wanna put in a plug and you should absolutely invite her. Um, Sarah Stancorp Taylor has recently written a book called Disobedient Women about the women who have been challenging uh, the SBC um, and do and using uh, social media to do that. Um, it is a remarkable book. I was able to watch her um, her book launch party, um, and I think it's um, it's one of the most important books in the last ten years for understanding. Um, religion and sexuality in the United States. Um, so, um, so yes, so, I mean, her book just came out like two weeks ago. So it's brand new. Uh, Dis um, Disobedient Women. Uh, so I'm sure women. Lindsay's probably already looking it up and going to post it yeah. on there. There yeah. are a few comments here. Let me just see if right. I can get yeah. to them. Um, I'm not sure, Sandy, about ex-Senate rep Victoria Steele. The thing is, what, if it's a Democratic bill, then the, it often doesn't even get a hearing. Less than 1% of the bills that the Democrats put forward even get a hearing. So she may yeah. have, but it probably died, stalled out, whatever. Um, I'm not sure what that's in reference to, but Marshall's saying, didn't Massachusetts do that years ago because of the Catholic Church lawsuits? Not sure what that means. Patty says, Patty, Representative Patty Contreras, by the way, who represents, I'm not remembering which district in Arizona, uh, but she says, youth are more aware. I believe the ability to access outside resources has helped young people to speak out and know what to report. I agree. Rebecca says, social media is making people realize that they are survivors because so much of this is normalized. Oh my gosh. Absolutely, Rebecca. And you don't always know yeah. what it was until you actually look back. Like, I yeah. mean, I, the Me Too movement changed my life. Like, as far as, you know, like, I really, it's not, it's not a, it's not that you don't remember it necessarily. It's more that you just, you push it away because society normalizes the abuse that we go through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Marshall, or uh, yeah, Marshall says, despite his tearful on-air apology in February 1988, Swagger was defrocked by the Assemblies of God in April, but continued to act as an independent Pentecostal preacher. In October 1991, police in Indio, California, found Swagger in the company of a prostitute after stopping him for a traffic violation, of course. Um, many pastors who have taught about adultery and sex fall into that same situation themselves. Jimmy Swagger is just one example. Oh my gosh, it's so true. Yeah, yeah. And it, well, and what's really interesting is that the the way that people think about sexual morality, right? That in the white evangelical world, swagger, you know, paying, uh, paying a sex worker um, is on par with a clergyman, you know, having, uh, you know, grooming a teenager, right? So they, they don't have um, the ability to really identify sexual harm and um and so in fact this is actually i think i do have um anyway we don't have to worry about these questions but like so what i've what i've learned after many years of this is that if you're teaching that sexuality sex outside of marriage is always harmful always harmful right? How do you teach young people what sexual harm is? Exactly. 
Yeah. I mean, the number of, you know, things that I've read about women who were in a marriage that was wholly abusive, W-H-O-L-L-Y, you know, like it was yeah. abusive. Yeah. And, and because the Bible told them that that's okay, they just put up with it, you know, yeah. like I, yeah. It's heartbreaking. This is a really good comment too, coming from Matt. He says, society also parades the accused instead of holding space for their victims. Look at Danny Masterson Mm -hmm. and look at our 45th president too, you know, like, and, and what happens when somebody stands up like, um, E. Jean Carroll or, um, Christine Blasey Ford or Anita Hill, yeah. You know, you get, I mean, thank goodness that, you know, Anita Hill probably avoided being dragged through the mud in the same way because there was no internet back then, right? Right, right, right. The, the amount of work that survivors have to do is incredible. Yeah. And, and I, and so to go back to Krista Brown, who, if, right, if you're on Twitter, she's an incredible person to follow. Like the, um, oh, the other thing is, so uh, last year, the Department of Justice opens an investigation into the SBC clergy sex abuse crisis, right? Now, they've, they've had quite a busy year, you may have noticed, um, and so nothing has come from them yet. I, d- I don't know when that will be, but it was because of Krista Brown that that happened, because she has not stopped for decades. Um, and her situation, she was a teenager who was groomed and, and coerced into a relationship with a youth pastor. Um, and it wasn't until her own daughter was 16 that she realized the nature of that relationship. Yeah. And, and that's and what then, happens. It, it, yeah. it takes you to get to the age, like when, like it, for me, it was having a student who was the age that I was, who shared with me during a leadership camp, which is a, like, it's one of those any town kind of leadership camps. Yeah, yeah. And, and there, I just saw right up in Scottsdale with these like purple parents, people, these moms for limited Liberty groups saying they don't want kids going on these trips, but you know what, that trip, she had the information that she needed my student to be able to identify the abuse that happened to her. And then it caused me to go yeah. in the you know way back machine and be like whoa that was never okay for me either you know and yeah. they want and that's the thing that that really rubs me is they want to do away with like those any town leadership camps right yeah, that they, that they want to do with comp- do away with comprehensive sex ed every accusation is a confession because if you want to keep kids in the dark about their own bodies and their own sexuality and and yeah. try to tell them that they're born of original sin and, and that you have to blanket train them and take them to a purity ball with their father or creepy uncle or whatever. Like, no. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Soapbox. I'm so sorry. And yeah, 103, no. and I want to honor your time. <laughs> no, that is fine. Well, and I do appreciate kind of the the heated commentary because often when I do these presentations, I know I have to be you know, respectable and professional when I just sort of want to shriek with rage. Um, And, you know, and I am someone who, you know, I wrote a whole book. I studied this for many years. It was my dissertation project. And um, and a, a friend of mine, she read it and realized before I did that the next thing I would be studying was sexual abuse. And that was never something I intended. And I also wanted to be very careful, right? Because when my book first came out, people were like, oh, this is child abuse. And I was like, that's not the argument I'm making. We got to look at the evidence, right? Look at what's happening, right? And of course, since then, the evidence has been bursting out, right? And um, and it is, I think, right? Me too is a big reason for it. Um, If you're um, if any of you are familiar with Church Two, another really important hashtag. Um, so Emily Joy Allison, um, who started that, she was also groomed as a teenager by a youth minister, um, was told to keep the relationship secret, you know, and then was blamed and felt guilty, you know, that she had done something horribly wrong. Um, but it wasn't until much later that she learned what grooming is, really is, right? And I 
you know, and this idea that that, that concept is being so misused right now, almost in like a, a Darvo kind of way, right? If you know, right? Yes. It, it's, it's really, um, it, it's really concerned. Cons uh, yeah. And that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's really concerning. Um, so yeah, so whatever we can do to, um, right, to encourage um, good sex education, um, to make those opportunities available to teenagers, especially, um, that's you know what, what and, be yeah. and because our, because our Friday conversations are often like, ugh, you know, like you're just like, yeah. oh, the weight of the world, but I want to, I look, a hope filled genie rarely ever happens. So like, I'm going to just keep giving hope this week because, in Florence, uh, I don't know if I think it's Florence Unified School District. I'm pretty sure in Florence is a, a rural community in Arizona. There is, uh, I, I believe, at least one prison there. There might even be two, like a men's and women's facility. I'm not sure. So you know how those communities are, right? And and they had an opportunity, you know, a, a vote that was coming up at, at the most recent meeting that happened last week uh, that would approve uh a good comprehensive sex ed curriculum to their high school students and the board in this rural community voted to approve it. Um, and, and we reached out to our members and said, Hey, can you write a letter, you know, to folks within that zip code? And I wrote one on, you know, on behalf of us as an organization and the contact that I have from that, that monitors what's going on in that district. Uh, she said that um, it was, it was broken apart not on um political party lines even though these are nonpartisan seats but they were it was divided on gender right so the women who were on that board understood the importance you know regardless of what their political party is and so there's some hope you know us being no. engaged in this kind of stuff and paying attention to it and calling it out when we see it are, are the reason why, you know, we could have progress in rural districts and urban districts and everywhere in between. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So again, I want to honor everybody's time. Sarah, do you have something maybe that would give us some hope and, and send us off to have a really good weekend? Yeah. Um, oh, shoot. Um, <laughs> I should have brought one. Um, I do have hope. Again, um, I mentioned Sarah's book and you know, being able to hear parts of it aloud and hearing her talk about it, and I and I have read it already, um, is hope. Because one of the things about experiencing any kind of trauma is that it's very difficult for survivors to tell their stories. And so as we have, as people are finding ways to tell their stories, whether that's incrementally through social media, or by sharing it with a journalist who can put it into an article or book, right? That's the hope, right? Is being able to provide uh, places where people can tell their stories and, um, and that they will be heard. Yeah, so that's what gives me the most hope in the work that I do. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. And, and just knowing, and even if you, like, cause I, I, after I told my story and did it very publicly back in 2021, people reached out to me and they were like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to tell my story, but thank you because I feel seen and heard now, you know? And yeah. so the more that we can do that and lean on each other and provide that strength for each other, we're going to be okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Honestly, I'm telling you, this is record breaking. You like you broke the internet, at least in <laughs> secular AC universe. So thank you so much. Oh. This was really great. I appreciate you. And I, I look forward to reading your book. I'm going to go order it right now from Changing Hands. Great. Thank you so much. It's And thank you for your work. Of course. Yeah. Thank Have you. a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the weather wherever you are. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.